Hi, this is Katie, and you are listening to the podcast, Let It Out, hosted by me, where I talk to fascinating, creative, cool people like today's guest, Sarah Britton. She is a author, she is a chef, she's a nutritionist, and she is the brains behind My New Roots, which was one of the first healthy food blogs I ever followed, and I just have such a love and admiration for her, which you'll hear all about in this episode. I gush about how she was one of the first people I ever followed and how much her blog and her work has meant to me. And she has a new book out, which I love, and you'll hear all about that concept. She's from Toronto and lives now in Copenhagen, and she's just a really groovy person. So we're going to get right to that episode, that conversation, if you will. But first, let's talk about the sponsors. I'm seriously so grateful for the brands that sponsor this podcast because this is my favorite thing to do and they allow me to keep doing it. So when you want to support the podcast, support the sponsors. And also, they're actually things that I genuinely love and I genuinely use and would want to be telling you about regardless. So first of all, care of vitamins. They're the coolest, you guys. And I've talked about them before. I'm talking about them again. Maybe it's new to you. Maybe you guys already love them too from me talking about them in the weeks past because I've been getting so many great messages from you guys that you've enjoyed trying out these vitamins. And the cool thing about Care-of is they're not just vitamins. You go to their website and you spend a couple minutes taking this really cool quiz that asks you questions about your energy levels and your diet and the way that you live your life, your lifestyle. And from there, it curates a custom blend of vitamins, all the nutritional things that you need, because, you know, we can't, no matter how healthy we eat, we can't get everything we need nutritionally from food, unfortunately. So that's where vitamins come in, and that's where care of comes in. It helps you fill those gaps. And the really cool thing about their site, other than the cool quiz that you take, is that every single month they'll send to you, or as often as you want, they'll send to you this really great little pack that's personalized. The design is fantastic. Their packaging is amazing. And everything comes to you in this beautiful little package. It even says your name on it. And you feel very special because I love personalized things. And I bet you do too. And that's why you will love Care of Vitamins. So I think you should try them. It's a lot cleaner in your cabinet. You don't have all these messy bottles. You just have the exact amount that you need. And it ends up saving you money because even though they source their vitamins to be the best ingredients and things that you need, they end up actually being cheaper when you purchase them this way. And if you want to just try it and see how this goes, you can do it for 50% off your first order. So you can try an entire month of care of supplements for 50% off if you use the code Katie at checkout. So go to takecareof.com. That's takecareof.com and use the code Katie, K-A-T-I-E, that's my name, and you'll get 50% off your first order. So I think you guys will really like it. I really do, and I really love them, and I'm so excited for you to try them. Those of you who have already tried them are loving them. Thank you for supporting the podcast. Thank you, Kara, for sponsoring this week's episode. All right, another really cool sponsor is Aptive. I've talked about Aptive before, and it's really fitting for this week's episode because Aptive is really cool because they let you exercise wherever you are in the world. And Sarah talks about exercise in this episode and how it's something that's really important to her and how she incorporates it in her life. And I think Aptive would actually be a really great app for her. I'm going to tell her about it because it's great. You can find hundreds of classes. They add hundreds of new ones every single month. And you can choose a new one every single week, every single day if you wanted. So there's variety and and it doesn't get old and you actually want to do it. They actually have really great music, and it's super easy to use, and I just think you'll really love it. So if you want to try it, you can get a 30-day free unrestricted trial by going to aptive.com and using the code LETITOUT at checkout. So the code is LETITOUT, 
and the website is aptive.com, so it's A-A-P-T-I-V.com, and check it out, 30 days free, might as well, right? All right, now let's get to my conversation with Sarah, and come back at the end because I will tell you the emoji for this episode and a couple other things. So love you guys. Enjoy the episode. Well, thank you again so much for, for doing the podcast. It it was cool when our mutual friend, Jess Renan, connected us because you have been and are one of my favorite food bloggers and cookbook authors and just people oh I goodness. follow on social media. And I've been following you for years. Like, I was one of the original people, I think, because I started following you when oh I was goodness. in college. Yeah, you taught me how to cook quinoa. You introduced me to so many things. You taught me about <laughs> soaking nuts. You taught me how to make nut milk. Like, literally, you were, like, from afar, my, like, holistic habits, like, Mama. <laughs> oh, or like, wow, that cool. means so much to hear. You have no yeah, idea. Yeah, cooler thank sister. You. That's, like, more like it. Um, <laughs> not That's to age so you, but... Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I Yeah, like I said, so excited to have you on the show, and, and you have such an interesting background and story to everything that led you to where you are and what you do, and I, I want to get into everything and everything behind how you started My New Roots, but... What I've been liking to do lately on the podcast before we get into the past and your past is starting in the present. So what are you really excited about? What are you um, really, what have you been learning lately as in like either today or the past week or even the month, but really present? Wow. What am I excited about? Well, oh, that's such a broad question. I know. Let <laughs> me. Let me think. Um, I mean, right now I'm so focused on this book tour coming up that I, I don't know if I'm learning that much lately. I'm more just like plowing ahead and really excited about the future, in fact. Um, but let me think on a day-to-day basis. I don't know. I'm learning to be a parent. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And really challenging. It's not work-related, so that's <laughs> I don't know if that's relevant. But um, yes. Learning life work balance, that's definitely my action journey these days. I know a lot of us, especially women, struggle with that. And I think it's something that needs to be talked about more and how we can support one another in it because, um, yeah, I think the last few years for me have been kind of a blur. And um, it's been, there's been so many amazing things that I've learned and discovered, but yeah, it's definitely a challenge trying to manage being a parent and running my own business at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm either, yeah, doing great at one, but then the other suffers or I'm just like lousy at both of them. So I'm trying to, uh, it's getting better, but, um, that's definitely an everyday learning for me for sure. Yeah. And I think so, like you said, so many people, especially women and especially mothers, struggle with that or, you know, have wrestled with that. But, okay, a couple of follow-up questions. So, first of all, congratulations on being a mother. And Oh, thanks. <laughs> and how old is your baby again? Finn is three now. Oh, my goodness. Three already. Yeah. Wow. He's not a baby like... anymore. I yeah. pretend he is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. He's a person. And he, I was about to be like, he came out the same time your book came out, but he was born <laughs> um, the same well, time. Well, it's so funny because – my the first book I had I actually signed the cookbook deal for the first book when I was four months pregnant and I had to have the book finished four months after he was born and I did as much as I could before he was born but because I was writing a seasonal cookbook I couldn't fake it I couldn't just like you know pretend it was February I mean I had to actually be in that time for it to make any sense and for me to have the you know the in outside environment looking correct so I could photograph that and um that was absolutely insane I had to work a week after he was born I actually photographed the last recipe in the book which was this towering chocolate cake a week after giving birth and I just remember thinking like what have I done (laughs) oh my goodness and then of course like through his infancy I was writing the second book so it's it's been a very interesting couple years of like I never because the blog, I mean, I try and do the blog as much as I can, and we're up to, like, twice a month at this point. I used to be at least once a week. 
and I've just had to scale back for, you know, because the business grew and because I've become a mom. Um, but I hadn't had such a long-term project, you know, on top of becoming, you know, a new parent at the same time. So it was a little like, wow, it was crazy to get my head around. But gosh, I'm really proud that it, you know, I have two books that came out of this period that was uh, pretty challenging. And I, I think they're they're both great. And I'm really, really excited for number two because... Um, it is really a response to people's feedback from the first one. Mostly it was positive, but there were a lot of, you know, single parents and students who didn't have the time or couldn't afford to go out and buy, you know, spirulina and bee pollen, which I totally get. So the second book is 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 really food for everybody. And every ingredient I got for the book, I purchased at a discount grocery store. Really? And yeah. Wow. So it's... Uh, it's a total, I shouldn't say a departure from, for me, but it, it gave me some creative boundaries and it, I really pushed myself and I'm really excited about the material because, um, I don't know, I think when I have free reign, it's a little, it's almost hard, like your opening question. I actually kind of like boundaries or, you know, have to be put in a box because it makes me think outside of it. Yeah. <laughs> I wow. Guess. I heard you yeah, say so, um, in another yeah. podcast. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was just gonna say I heard you say in another podcast that you love Project Runway, and so I feel like it's kind of interesting with the parameters. It's kind of like Project Runway, or I think there's other shows yeah. on the Food Network where they where they do that, like you know, give you so many like ingredients. Yeah, and you kind yeah. of have this new challenge, and it sounds like that. I didn't realize that you bought all the ingredients for the new book at a regular grocery store and, and not at a health yeah. food store. What a what an interesting challenge. That's so cool. And that's, like you said, I think that's what puts people off to holistic cooking and, you know, cooking different from the mainstream because they're like, oh, I but look at all those ingredients and her pantry's so stocked. And then they just, like, are put off to the whole thing at all when they could do right. some of it. And I think this is... It's, it can be so polarizing. So what a cool idea that, that you took on. Well, thanks. I mean, I just think that, you know, healthy eating shouldn't be, um, it's just, it's kind of becoming elitist if you ask me. Like, yeah. you know, you walk into a health food store and there's like, you know, some powder for $60 that you're supposed to need. And I just, I feel like, you know, you can still get kale at the grocery store. You can still get beets. You can still get brown rice. You can still get sesame seeds. So the book is just very focused on, on simple ingredients and ways of bringing out the flavor in foods that are also really simple. So in the beginning of the book, I, I list and talk about in depth, like, each of these cooking techniques that I employ throughout the book. And then uh, recipes that I recommend trying so you can actually make the connect between the food and the cooking process. So it could be something like charring. Like I'm really into charring food lately. So either I roast it in the oven for a bit or steam it and then like get a scorching hot skillet and just sear the heck out of that food. And what happens is the sugars caramelize. You actually create um, all kinds of different flavor profiles that didn't exist before. But it's not about adding anything to the food. It's actually just about the cooking technique. So um, this book is a little more focused on that as well. And how can we draw flavor out of food? Um, how can we draw the nutrients out of food? And um, I don't know. I'm really excited to show people that as well. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be great. Like, how do we make a tomato in February taste amazing? Because, yeah. you know, if we're eating a tomato in February, it's, <laughs> it's likely not going to taste great. But I'm going to show you how to make it taste great and how to make it more nutritious and all these things. So, yeah, I'm really – I'm very excited for it to be out in the world. It comes out tomorrow. Yeah, even though I, know. I was just going to say. So by the time this is out, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, congratulations. It's so amazing. What is it called? It's just called so Naturally Nourished. I love it. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited. I well, really, thank you. I really liked what you said there about, you know, it health being what we were talking about, about being – polarizing and kind of elitist and I think you know it's being someone who was so in it and so you know to a fault into 
you know, the people who listen to the podcast have heard all about my thoughts and feelings on this, but, you know, <laughs> not being able to see the forest through the trees of being someone so into their spirulina and chlorella and bee pollen. But mm-hmm. it, I did realize in the last few years, like you were saying, it is, um, it's a very privileged place to be and it is becoming the new class system. And I think that's, you know, as the health movement grows and it becomes trendy, these things that were so niche before, which, you know, in a lot of ways is a good thing. You know, there are areas, you know, in this country that are food deserts and don't have access to, to healthy food. And, and that's a problem. So I'm glad that, you know, things are being talked about. But at the same time, it can be, you know, this new class system bringing us further apart than bringing us together. And I think your work and your book does the opposite. So I'm curious, you know, you live in Copenhagen now, you know, what is the mm-hmm. pulse on things there, you know, going into a mainstream grocery store or, the, you know, do they still have like, you know, organic things and, you know, good fruits and vegetables and coconut oil and like, what is the pulse there? Is it similar to, you know, you, you spend a lot of time in the States. I know you're coming to the States really soon. Um, but do you, what is kind of, what are some differences there? I would love to know what the cultural, you yeah. know, climate's like. Well, it's very funny. I moved here eight and a half years ago and you could not get even sweet potatoes in Copenhagen. And this is like, you know, the capital of the country. I mean, this is if, if there's going to be sweet potatoes anywhere, it would be Copenhagen. Um, quinoa was unheard of. So very behind uh, in terms of the health food movement. Wow. But what's interesting is that Danes cook. So by virtue of that fact, they're all healthier than North Americans because they make food every single day. They cook from scratch. They make their own bread. They sit down and eat a civilized meal every night. Like it's a very familial society built around food and traditional cooking. So although they don't have, you know, nutritional yeast, (laughs) they cook from scratch. And, you know, as Michael Pollan, my hero, always says, like, you can eat whatever you want. You just have to make it yourself. So Danes are healthier because they make food themselves, which I think is really what's missing in North American societies. We've really lost the connection to to food and family and community through cooking. Something I'm very passionate about trying to, you know, revive because I, I you know, this is a whole other political discussion. <laughs> I could go on a crazy tangent about that, Katie. Anyway, um, but what's interesting is in the last eight and a half years, you know, all of these things, these popular foods that are popular in North America have made their way over here. And I think also from the German influence because, you know, we're uh, Northern German neighbors or just north of Germany, they are neighbors. Um, The health food scene there is huge and enormous and actually really Really? progressive. In Germany? Yeah, it's amazing the difference. It's amazing the difference. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, I know, right? So I'm sure it was a combination of German products coming north and then North American stuff um, coming east. So it's, I don't know. I mean, you can pretty much get everything now, but it's very expensive. I mean, food in Denmark is it's around, I don't want to say it's double, but it's almost double the price than it is at home. And so health food products, which are highly specialized and still very niche here in a lot of ways are, I mean, ridiculous. Example, nutritional yeast, which I'm like, <laughs> I eat so much nutritional yeast. It's oh, not me even too. right. I love it. <laughs> I love it. But it is, it's $20 for a very small jar of it. And it, at home, I mean, it's like, free it's like woohoo so I end up bringing like a couple kilos of nutritional yeast back with me so I have room in my suitcase when I come on tour because that's the first thing I'm gonna buy oh that's so Um, funny and you know any supplements any superfoods I mean it's just it's punishing how much it costs here so it was actually interesting part of my incentive for writing the second book was also like how can I how can I do this in a more affordable way um, and the concept sort of evolved really naturally until I was like, wait a minute, I'm just going to do the whole book from like, it wasn't even just a regular grocery store. It's like the cheap grocery store. Wow. And although I will admit, I mean, you know, if I was going to buy beets, which I knew were available at this discount grocery store, I would go buy them from the farmer's market or something, <laughs> at least, yeah. you know, that were organic and locally produced which I always encourage people to do. And this is the funny thing that I've heard about the second book is people I can't believe you're not, you wouldn't say you should get organic. I say at the beginning of the book, if you have access to and can afford, you know, locally produced products, 
or the health food store or whatever, then please do that. Obviously, I recommend that. But, you know, again, this book should be for everyone. Everyone has access to kale and, you know, tahini. So let's let's go that route. And um, gosh, it was, yeah, I'm really happy with the recipes. Yeah, I really love that concept so much. And I'm learning so much. I had no idea about the differences between Germany and, and Denmark and that's fascinating to me. And it, it is fascinating, you know, I'm pretty unfamiliar, like what the, you know, health food climate is like overseas. But why do you think that that is that, you know, it's kind of it's still so niche in Copenhagen, yet in Germany, it's really popularized? Why do you and, you know, and even like, areas of the States, it's kind of the same thing. How do you think that that kind of happens? I'm just curious. Well, I mean, for one, Denmark is such a small country. I mean, it's 5 million people, and Germany's 80 million people. So um, that alone, I mean, just importing stuff and just having a market, I mean, is there's just no market here. It's, you know, and people are also very traditional. There's an amazing holding on to especially food tradition here in Denmark, and I think it's because it is such a small country, and they, they are protective of their culture. And... Um, yeah, I mean, how is your work? Like, been- like, even if you want Mexican food, you can't get it. If you want good Thai, can't get it. If you want whatever, it's just it doesn't happen here. It's so funny, <laughs> frustrating yeah. actually, because you know I would really love to go for Indian sometimes, but I'm out of luck. I mean, it's just not an inter. It's just not a very multicultural society, and. Um, and people are really, they, they tend to be old fashioned, like really holding on to tradition, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, when I go into a room and I start talking about, you know, plant based milk and how maybe that's better for them, I mean, I'm almost chased out with like torches and pitchforks. Like, <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. I was just going to ask how your work was received there. That's so interesting. Yeah. Well, with, with great skepticism and, and, um, and sometimes anger because, <laughs> I mean, to tell a society that has subsisted on dairy products for hundreds of years, it's like what kept Danes alive through the winter, to tell them that there are more healthful solutions or alternatives, it's like, that's a really enraging thing to say to a culture. So, although, now I will also be fair, like Northern Europeans have like incredibly evolved to produce the sugar enzyme needed in their pancreas to digest milk past the age of two, which is when most of us actually stop producing lactase, um, which is, which is great for them. It's, it still doesn't mean it's like good for them, but they can tolerate it. Most of them, whereas most of the world is lactose intolerant for good reason. So it's like a little nuts to me that I don't know. And there's so much propaganda around milk here. It makes me insane, but, um, you know, that's just the way it is. Other but than on other fronts, like um, you know, there is a real movement towards more plant-based eating here, which is fantastic. Because oh my goodness, forever I was like you know the weirdo in the room talking about being a vegetarian, um, which is still very niche here, I'll say. But it's it's becoming less, and it's really exciting to see the movement. And I mean, now I can go to almost any restaurant in Copenhagen and you know get a I, I'm going to use air quotes, a plant-based meal, which is awesome. But I mean, I, I went to a place last week, uh, actually, and they, I made sure on the phone that they could do a plant-based meal and they just let up the meat off basically. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like the U S and Canada where you have, I mean, a restaurant that doesn't have a vegetarian option, like a solid vegetarian option is just shooting themselves in the foot because they have to, I mean, that's just standard now, yeah. but here it's not. Um, it is changing. The climate's changing for sure. But um, I know when I came here, I was definitely the weirdo. And yeah, that's still so I'm a- mm-hmm. Other than dairy and meat, what I have no idea what Danish traditional food is. What What is it really? Well, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. No, uh, and white potato, like potatoes, which is funny. I don't eat any of those things, really. Uh, I eat a little bit of dairy, but only goat and sheep dairy. I don't eat cow dairy. Um, but it's the land of meat, milk, and potatoes, and I don't eat any of those things. So it's 
it's also really hilarious. I didn't end up in like a tropical fruit location uh, really or something is. like that. Oh my goodness, but, that's um, so funny. And a lot of like brown sauce and, you know, I think what Noma has done is really changed sort of the perception of Danish food because Rene Redzepi, who's the head chef at Noma, he started celebrating all the local wild foods in Denmark. So like all the weird plants and sea vegetables and berries and he's done all these exciting things to them. So he's really put, I mean, he literally changed the face of modern cuisine. Was he um, on Chef's Table? Is there a, an episode of that? On Is that that guy? I actually don't think he was. Okay. Different um, different. But, uh, oh gosh, I thought I'd seen every episode of Chef's Table. Which season? One or two? I think he I'm wasn't thinking on of the right... Then. I don't, I don't know. I watched it, like, I, like, binge-watched it when I was staying with my friends in <laughs> New York a couple weeks ago, and we watched, like, four or five episodes together, and I don't know what season we were watching, but it was the first episode of whatever season it was. And I, okay. for some reason, thought it was in Denmark, but I, it could totally not be Denmark. You might be thinking of Magnus Nilsson in Sweden, Yes. Perhaps? That's what I'm thinking of. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. So, um, also an awesome dude, and also someone who's taking real advantage of of Swedish lo- local foods. I mean, but again, yeah. like Rene Redzepi influenced all of these chefs, like to the nth degree. And I mean, the whole foraging trend is because of him. Wow. That's why people have been looking at. Okay, what's around me? Oh, we have this like crazy. These crazy edible twigs that, like, we didn't even know we could munch on. But now we can, and I'm going to pickle them and do all this weird stuff to them. So that's that's because of Rene Redzepi. Wow. Um, so the food scene in Copenhagen, because um, they were named Best Restaurant. Gosh. I shouldn't. I don't want to miss my or mess this up. Anyway, some years ago. It was um, I was working there in between the time they got their second and third uh, number one spot in the world. And... Uh, anyway, this is such a tangent, but anyway, he's, I mean, if you go to a restaurant and you see, you know, like vegetables being the centerpiece or like things that are plated in this really delicate, beautiful manner, that's all, that's all him. And you worked, you worked with him? I worked, um, I worked at Noma on a special assignment, um, some years ago because I thought if I live in this city with the best restaurant in the world, I should probably try and get in there and do something. (laughs) So I came on to do a project with them. It was a vegetarian dinner, and I worked on it for three months. One meal. Wow. What was the meal? Yes. It was um, it was nine courses, and it was actually it was for the Fashion Coalition of Scandinavia, which is sort of the overseeing body for the fashion industry here, and wow. their mandate for 2020 was to become CO2 neutral, which is really exciting. Yeah. So to kick things off, they wanted to do a fully plant-based dinner, and so they brought me in to be a consultant and recipe developer for that. And uh, it was crazy. We actually, every course was, was I was going to say fashioned after, but <laughs> that would be very funny of me, um, was modeled after. That would also be fun. <laughs> <laughs> every course of the dinner was modeled after the stages of creation in the fashion process. So the first one was... Um, the brainstorming phase. So we had like a very, wow. uh, a blank canvas of a Nordic tofu that I created. And then we had like powders and syrups and all kinds of things that you would like brainstorm on your dish, your own dish. Oh, so there was like. Oh my gosh, how creative and c- interactive and cool. And really neat, you know. And then we, w- we you know, went into um, the materials course, which was I made um, or recreated silkworm pods so like the it was a ball it's a crispy ball um with a lacto fermented rhubarb in the center which looked like bloody goo a little bit (laughs) which is what i wanted and then the outside i made a savory candy floss so it looked like a silkworm egg and then you bit into it and it was like salty sweet crunchy sour goopy like crazy and then we moved on to like the fabric stage so i made fabric out of vegetables like actual cloth and you can 
you would like use the cloth on your plate to wrap stuff. And I don't know. I was just, it was really, oh really fun. Oh my gosh. I'm like dying over this. It so ties <laughs> into your love of Project Runway, the show. And then also oh, yeah, your. I actually have thought about that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Although that no, everything happens for a reason. Connecting the dots backwards. No wonder you liked watching Project Runway. It led you to create oh, this funny. amazing meal. And wow. And you're, you have a background in fine arts and, and painting and, and graphic design. So um, yeah. it's yeah. so amazing that you were able to use all of that creativity and you do every day, but what a beautiful thing that you got to create and collaborate on. It was really special. I got to say it was really fun. And I mean, I learned so much. I think they were a bit frustrated with me in the kitchen because I'm not classically trained and like if you're going to work at the best restaurant in the world, you better know how to make like marshmallows, for instance. I don't know how to make a marshmallow. I mean, so it was, it was also very interesting because whenever I do chef collaborations, and which I love so much, it's very interesting because I, I'm learning so much. I'm taking so much away from these, you know, the best chefs in the world that have so such a classical technique driven background. And I'm coming in with these ingredients that they know nothing about. Right. And even things right. like, you know, cooking with olive oil, like how many chefs I've, you know, turned away from using olive oil to cook with. Um, it's really cool uh, sharing and like, you know, I want to say like co-creative experience and really inspiring for all parties involved. So yeah. it's one of my favorite things to do. And um, yeah, I don't know. Really interesting. I think I get a lot more out of it than they do. Yeah. But <laughs> No, I, I'm sure. I'm sure you're teaching them so much, just like you were saying with the olive oil thing. I I want There's so many directions I want to go with this conversation. I want to get you know back to your story a little bit, and you know how you ended up in Copenhagen, and how you ended up you know from fine arts to yes, cooking yes. and food and holistic health. But first, just to you know clue people in with what you said about olive oil, you know. Give us that little spiel that you give to chefs who are, you know, for people listening, maybe cooking with, with olive oil. Why is that a, a simple, um, perhaps, swap? And, and how yeah. would you explain that to someone? Well, when you cook with olive oil, olive oil has a very low smoke point, actually. And the smoke point is the temperature at which an oil burns. And we now know very clearly that... Uh, burnt fat is incredibly uh, dangerous to our health. It causes oxidative stress in the body and it's carcinogenic. So uh, you're not only creating like, you know, potential free radical damage in your body, which is not something we want. You're actually, um, you are losing all of the flavor. So if you're even just from a taste perspective, it's a shame to cook with olive oil because you, as soon as you heat it, it's, it's gone. And that's, it not only takes the nice flavor away, it actually it makes it really bitter and really um, sort of like acrid tasting. It's not good. Yeah. So just from a taste perspective, not even a nutrient perspective, cooking with olive oils is not a good idea, um, especially in a frying pan because we just don't know how hot it's getting, and that's, uh, that's the dangerous part. Now, baking with olive oil if you're, you know, going to bake something at 350 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, that's fine. I mean, it's not great, but I mean, olive oil and cake is uh, delicious. So I think in those instances, special treat, go for it. But what I always recommend to people, if they're going to cook vegan, um, expeller pressed coconut oil has a very high smoke point. So you can, you can like get a good sear on food with that. And then ghee, which is really the only cow dairy that I'll eat. Um, ghee is a clarified butter, super simple to make. Uh, yourself at home there's a recipe in the first cookbook and on my blog and in the app that I have um, on how to make ghee and it's like you basically boil butter for 15 minutes and strain it and then you have uh, a totally shelf stable cooking fat you can leave the butter the ghee out on your counter for like six months it's incredible wow cool thank yeah. you for explaining that so like this nugget of information that you have and so many more that I've learned on your blog. And I kind of want to geek out with you after this and just tell you about all my favorite <laughs> recipes that I've made when I was, like, younger. And just I loved your blog early on, which I just think it's so neat to be talking to you now. But how did My New Roots come to be? And how did you grow up eating? What was your relationship to food like as a kid and a teenager and a young yeah. adult? And then when did that change? And how did that change? Well... 
I grew up eating a very normal diet. Um, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, actually, and my parents, my dad was traveling a lot for work. My mom, neither neither of my parents like cooking. They find it really sort of drudgery. Um, And amazingly, I didn't totally absorb their attitudes. I, when I uh, moved out of the house and started living on my own, I... I don't know, like I had an interest in it, but it was very baffling to me because I had no background in it. I really didn't understand cooking. Uh, The cooking I did was like I'd boil pasta and like put a jar of sauce on top and like, you know, I don't know, like that was the extent of my understanding because that's what my parents did and that was all I knew. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was quite overweight and felt terrible all the time, but I had no idea why. I just thought that everyone probably felt like that. Do you have brothers and (laughs) sisters? I do. I have a little brother, okay. five years younger than me. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I never thought to ask, but cause I didn't know that I felt bad, Katie. I just thought that that was how people felt yeah. all the time. And um, anyway, so that was how I grew up. Then I went to work on this organic farm in Arizona uh, because I had studied this place in design school and university. And for whatever reason, I was called to the organic farm. And at that time, I was really thinking that organics was a load of BS, actually. And I kind of went down with my backup, hoping to, like, you know, prove that it was, you know, a farce and that we were all paying $4 for broccoli unnecessarily. So, but what happened was, within the first, like, week I was there, I had the most profound physical transformation I had ever experienced. Because without really without knowing that this would happen, I gave up all processed foods. I think if anyone tries to do that consciously, it's a lot more difficult. But I went down there, and I only had access to what we were growing. And, you know, with the sugar out of my system, finally, because I was like such an insane sugar addict, with the sugar out of my system and, you know, the processed grains and stuff, I literally woke up for the first time. I felt like you know, the mental fog I had been living in for 23 years had just lifted and I could finally see clearly. And I realized just how powerful food is, like what it can do for you and how it makes you feel. And this whole idea of you are what you eat, it's unfortunately, it's become a cliche because that's literally all we are. Yeah. Every cell of our body is only made of food. So for, for people to say, oh, you know, I'm, for people not to turn to food as the first thing when they are not feeling great is, ah, it's such a shame because that's that's where it starts in both curing and prevention. And that's why I'm really focused on eating healthy every day because that's the prevention part of it. And we could really save ourselves so much pain and agony and hassle and confusion and whatnot if we were all just eating closer to the earth and being more connected to the food you're choosing because it's not complicated it just takes a bit of a life shift and yeah. once you're there it's second nature that's the cool thing anyway I'm rambling no, so great. my new route started because when I got back from this year-long immersive experience on this farm uh, you know I have a degree in design and when I went down to you know, work. At I want to do farm. that. The year long immersive experience sounds amazing. It was, it was incredible, especially since I went down with the intention of staying for five weeks. I mean, wow. yeah, it was like, I really woke up. I can't say that enough times because like I suddenly had energy to do things. I didn't know, again, I didn't know how bad I felt. Suddenly I had energy to exercise which is a whole other kettle of fish because as soon as you start exercising and like moving your body, I mean, what opens up is, is truly remarkable. I'm very passionate about exercise as well. I think it's like so important. And, you know, I mean, I got my ass kicked. Oh, sorry. Can I say that word? Yes. Yes. Go for it. (laughs) Feel free. I got my ass every day on this farm. It was like, gosh, you just develop such a deep appreciation for people who make our food. Mm -hmm. It is, like, the most important job in our society. And I don't know why we're not more connected to our farmers, but that's just the system that that we have set up, unfortunately. Um, So between working on the farm eight or nine hours a day and then, you know, eating this food, I suddenly had more energy to exercise and, like, my body just came alive. And they all sort of, yeah, 
it just one thing fed the next and I just became a completely different person. Wow. Everything changed. So I got back to Toronto and my life had become so in tune with the natural environment and suddenly I'm in a huge city again and I'm living at home. I'm just like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> um, and I thought, I just need to get as close to the food again as I can. But I really wanted to understand like, okay, why was this year so profound? Like, what was what was the food doing in, in me? And so I found a school, a private school dedicated just to this very thing uh, called the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. And I decided that I would go back to school and I wanted to learn about this. And my parents freaked out because they said like, what does this have to do with design? You just finished university a year ago. Like, what is this about? I'm like, I don't know yet. Please trust me. This is just, this is, I got to do this. It's calling to me. And I knew it was the right decision instantly. I mean, the first class, I was studying Ayurveda, actually. And I was just, this is amazing. It was so exciting. And, you know, all the things that I had learned started, that learned on the farm started overlapping. And I, I could finally sort of draw all these lines between this food that I ate and this way that I felt. And it was just the most exciting thing. I was just just bursting with, you know, excitement and enthusiasm and, like, aliveness. And, you know, I had this boyfriend at the time who was, like, not into this stuff. And I was, I be, over the course of this year, I just became more and more impassioned. And he became <laughs> less and less interested <laughs> <laughs> of like listening to me go on and on and on about kombucha and finally he said you know what you should write a blog about this and this this proves how long ago it was I said to him what is a blog and he said it's a place where you can tell people who care to listen about this stuff and <laughs> I and, love uh, this story so much <laughs> yeah. but it's true and so he really needs all the credit because he was the one that gave me the idea to start my new roots so Dumped him. The blog began, and oh gosh, at the beginning, I mean, I don't know, Katie, if you've been back to 2007 to see mm -hmm. <laughs> the original posts, but holy lightning, they are scary. I mean, I just didn't know what blogging was, so I would write a few sentences and post like a hideous, artificially lit photo of something. But there was no one was really blogging, so there was no one to look up to, and I, I just, I didn't know. And then, what's been so interesting? is over the last decade seeing blogging just become this yeah this whole thing of its own i mean it's truly unbelievable and the talent is astonishing and it's really exciting to be a part of a community um a food community is really cool because i have friends all over the world and readers all over the world and yeah yeah i don't know i'm pretty grateful that with that guy yeah and the landscape <laughs> is, is completely yeah. Suggest yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the landscape is completely different now too for for blogging in general and and health and and food bloggers, but it's I love I heard you tell that story on um our other mutual friend Katie's podcast and yes. I was just laughing so hard because I also my blog used to be called The Wellness Wonderland and it was much more focused on wellness from a physical standpoint and now you know I think it's an umbrella thing that kind of covers lots of different areas of life but yes. at the time I the reason why I started it was the same thing my boyfriend at the time was like why didn't you just start a blog and then you don't have to talk to me about it about all this stuff <laughs> and it was the exact same thing so I just had to laugh so hard and he literally like built me a website and was like here you go you know so it's so funny <laughs> it's so funny how, how that kind of thing happens oh but, it is like you said, the the landscape for blogging is, is so different now and it's so much more saturated. But what, you know, advice or tips if you had to, you know, quick fire kind of give a couple to food and, and health bloggers or people wanting to, you know, have something that is at the level of my new roots, what are some of the, you know, tips that you would give? Well, I think for one, making uh – specializing in your field so like pick something that you are really passionate about and are really good at because those things combined mean that you're gonna do it <laughs> because I think the hardest part about blogging um, is the consistency and the commitment and if you really really love what you're doing then you'll do it naturally I mean even if the blog even if it you know I don't know what am I gonna say here 
I mean, I'll do the blog forever just because I love it. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't make me any money, but I mean, th- that's fine. It's, it's my passion project. So you have to do something that you know you're going to be able to keep up with and that you'll remain passionate about. So picking something that you love, you'll just naturally do that. So that's number one for sure. And specializing, I think, has become increasingly important because, uh, you know, it's pretty saturated out there at this point. So you got to set yourself apart somehow and choosing something, again, that you're the best at is is your best bet. So that's number one. And then I think just connecting with other people and creating a community. I think um, my take on the whole thing is I, I'm so blown away by how inclusive everyone is and how helpful and um, you know, a lot of people think there's this crazy competition between food bloggers, and I actually think it's the opposite. I think it's the most inclusive, wonderful community of like-minded people, and we all share this passion, and we're all really, and we're all enthusiastic about helping each other. And there's room for everybody. There's room for everybody in this. Yeah. And yeah, so I think if people are like, oh, I don't know where to start, and there's all these people doing it, then like connect with those people, have them help you, because you'll you know, they'll turn around and ask you for something someday. And that's what this is all about. The more people, the more people doing it, you know, the the more it is a trend. I mean, I felt like when I started, there really weren't a lot of people doing what I was doing. And I actually felt very alone. And my mom is so funny. She's very protective of me. And she's always like, oh, I just saw a blog post about this similar thing over here. This was years ago. And I'm like, mom, that's a positive thing. That means this is becoming a movement. It's not just like me, the freak in the corner, suggesting that, you know, people eat tempeh. It's like the more people that can back this up, the less crazy I seem. So she didn't really get that for a long time. But I, again, there's room for everybody and everyone has their take on things. And um, creating that community is really important. Becoming a part of the community is really important. So, yeah. Yeah. That's those are great. I want to get a little bit back into your story because people are probably wondering. You were in Nashville, then you were in Toronto, and how did oh, yeah. you end up in Copenhagen? So, what were those early days of the blog like, and how did you end up there? Yeah, so I was blogging for about a year. Um, I'm trying to think of dates, but yeah, well, nine months or something when I met this very lovely Danish man on a street corner in New York. And he was there on vacation. I was there on vacation. He asked me for directions because he wanted a place to go dancing, which is like the best line ever. (laughs) (laughs) And he actually wasn't a line. He actually meant it. But I said, I don't know. I'm from Toronto. Uh, And then, of course, you know, I'm from Toronto. So we, of course, got to talking. And then a year, a year and a bit later, I moved over here. So he was in Toronto studying. That was a crazy coincidence, was that he asked the one person in New York that was from the wow. place he had just to. Um, and so we, the reason we started chatting on the street for so long, like 45 minutes, was mm-hmm. because uh, he was living right across the street from a restaurant I used to work in. So I knew the neighborhood really well. And I said, oh, my gosh, you've got to go here and do this. Blah, blah. So we were together for his six months um, in Toronto while he was finishing his MBA. Then we did long distance for almost a year. And oh, wow. then what was that like? Terrible. It sucks. Long distance is really hard. But you know Yeah. Do you have any if advice? You think it's worth it. it. Like if you know, if you just know, then you just do it. You just suck it up. I mean, I, I was teaching high school at the time, so and I was on contract, so I couldn't just pick up and leave. He had just gotten a great job here in Copenhagen after his education, so he didn't want to go anywhere. And it made the most sense when my contract, my teaching contract was up that I moved over here, even though I left my whole life behind. Yeah. Yeah. It was nuts. Like I'm, I'm so close with my family and I have such a wonderful connection with my friends and it was the hardest decision I've ever made. I felt, I felt like an insane person, but I still feel like an insane person. Actually, every time I leave Toronto, I'm like just devastated for Mm. days. But, um, at the, you know, but I love it here so much, and I have great friends here now, and I love my husband's family, and uh, I don't know. Now I'm sort of, it'll be awful to leave either place. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness for the internet. <laughs> Thank goodness for Skype. Holy yeah. cow. I actually remember the first time I used Skype was I called my dad when I first moved here, 
That was the first time I used Skype. And we were both just like blown away. I actually had not remembered that until this moment. And wow, what a crazy, uh, that was a pretty cool moment. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I've been in Copenhagen for eight and a half years. And, and you really, like it now. Now you have a community there as well. Big time. And it's such a great place to live. It's such a beautiful city. I mean, as a design background lady, it's uh, it's sort of like design mecca. And it's it's just, everything is so thoughtfully done. Everything's so beautifully built. The, the combination of old and new here is so seamlessly done. And I'm obsessed. Like it, it will be very hard to go anywhere else because it's just so aesthetically tuned wow. and I've become Scandinavian in my sensibilities I have to say it's oh, really fun cool wow yeah it's interesting because I I've always wanted to go to Copenhagen I've always I think probably because I I follow you but you know I think of it I didn't know that about design really but I always think of it as you know a very environmental city because you know they hosted that that conference a yes. few years ago and um and I was studying environmental journalism at the time that that happened so I always associate it with that so that's why I was kind of surprised about um when you said the CO2 emissions um that was really cool but I'm kind of surprised there isn't more vegetarianism there right? because that's so good for the environment yes it's like the reason I became a vegetarian actually right no it's just not really I don't know. I guess they just haven't made the connection. Um, and here's a fun fact. There are five pigs for every human in Denmark. Wow. Really? That's how many pigs are raised in this country. Wow. It's land of pork. And ironically, most of that pork gets shipped off to the UK where they're like obsessed with bacon. And the meats that Danes choose to eat are actually like the scrappy ends that they turn into meatballs. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Anyway, that's a that's a whole other tangent. Well, but you could just get a Sharpie and go over all of that um, milk propaganda and just be like, did you guys know that there are five pigs for every human here? <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah, well, I think, I'm pretty sure that's common knowledge, but I mean, 25 million hogs is a lot. I mean, that's yeah. outrageous, but wow. that's true. <laughs> or maybe it's four. Maybe it's 20 million pigs. Anyway, it's a lot more pigs than people. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, vegetarianism is still seen as super niche and huh. a little bit weird. A little bit weird. Like, why would you do that? Why would you eat? Why would you not eat meat? It's delicious. It's abundant. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Well, well getting back to uh, your story. So you're in Copenhagen, and I heard you say on a fast forward, you know, many years, but I heard you say again on, on Katie's podcast that for the past few years, your husband has come to work with you on My New Roots. And I was wondering, you know, how you guys came to that decision and what it's been like working with your significant other. Yes. Well, uh, when we had our son, my husband was working at a design firm. And he's sort of, um, he's really into sort of communication and brand um uh, and branding, brand communication. So it's kind of perfect. But he also is a super tech geek and like has a lot of uh, understanding of, yeah, all the web stuff and back end whatnots, like the things that I just seriously don't care to know about yeah. <laughs> at all. Um, when, when our son was born, uh, Mikkel was in a really stressful situation with work and again, trying to achieve the life work balance that we're all struggling for. And, um, he took, because in Denmark, you can take paternity leave for nine months. That's um, amazing. Yeah, like paid paternity leave. Wow. For months. So he took the paternity leave. And while we wow. were you know, so snuggling crazy. all at home with a newborn, um, he was just realizing that returning to work would mean not doing that anymore and he's like I will never see you guys I will only see Finn when he's asleep in his crib um and he's like he'd also been he had been helping me for years um, again on the back end of things but you know there's only so much time on the weekends and at night after work that you have energy to work more but he just saw so much potential in what I was doing but because I'm like an anti-business person <laughs> I'm like the worst business person of all time uh, learning, but uh, it's a slow road. Um, 
he just was like, ah, I, I just, he wanted to get in there so badly because he saw that, you know, there could be so many improvements made. And yeah, so after, during those nine months, he, we worked together a little bit and then he's like, you know what? I just, I want to quit my job. I want to quit my job and let's do this together. So in 2015, January 1st, he came on board. So it's been two years, almost exactly. And it's just been amazing. We, we took the first 12 months as sort of a trial period to see, you know, he took on some specific projects like my app, for instance, which he did himself. I mean, with a development team, but I mean, that was all his project. Uh, he's also helped so much with oh, all kinds of other little things that we're doing. And I mean, everything has, he's touched has turned to gold and he just has a really great business sense and he, he's very good at seeing into the future, which is really important. And um, he's really good at communicating and um, yeah, and I'm plugging, plugging my talents into some kind of revenue stream. Because again, like I said, I'm a terrible business person. I would just work for free forever. All I do is, I, all I want to do is just like give away my stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah, thanks. And uh, he's like, this will literally make us homeless. Here's what you have to do. <laughs> so he um, he's able to take what I'm good at and make money from it in some way. So that's that's his strength. And he can oh, see. Oh, we all need one of those. <laughs> yeah, we all need that. Yeah. He's like, you want to do what you love? Okay, here's how it's going to, here's how it's going to go. So, which is great. I mean, I'll always do the blog for free. That's great. But now what I have you know, on the side are all these projects that are keeping a roof over our head, which is awesome, <laughs> like really important, and uh, food in the fridge. So, yeah, it's it's been fantastic. And I mean, honestly, I was, he, I was really scared that we would just be at each other's throats after a while. And like, it would, you know, I think that's everyone's fear when they start working with their significant other or, you know, I'd have people saying, oh my God, you guys are going to get a divorce if you do that. But actually, we've become even closer, mm. more in love. Um, I feel so lucky to be in a partnership with him, not only in life, but, you know, we, we're making our dreams come true. Like, we just got back from a month in Bali, for crying out loud. That's you know, amazing. Where I was, I was holding a retreat in Bali, and we brought our son, and, you know, during the week-long retreat, uh, Nickel and Finn were together, and, you know, he was doing the stay-at-home dad thing, which he will also do when I'm on this three-week book tour. Um, you know, and it's great. And the other three weeks, we were doing a little bit of work during the day, but mostly just, like, together as a family and because we can do this from wherever we are in the world, and that was the ultimate dream, and we we just made it a reality. And Aww. it's incredible. Yeah. Like, I can't believe the things we're creating together. It's there are no limits, and I think that's the exciting thing. When both people are on board, you can go anywhere, and you can do whatever you want. Yeah. You really – it's like we keep saying to ourselves, like, okay, what's next? Like, how big can we dream? How big can we make this? And it's like – it's endless. Like, it's really as only limited as our imagination. It's very cool. Oh, I want that. That is so inspiring and amazing, and can you guys adopt me? <laughs> <laughs> Do you yes. need an adult child? Because I'm your girl. <laughs> I would fit in great. <laughs> uh, I love all of that. And I want to come to one of your retreats one day. That sounds magical. Oh, you got to. It was honestly like I, I start giggling when I talk about it. Katie, it was just incredible. I I don't know. The group of women who came, they were they just gelled so well and they were just, oh such a cool range of ages and backgrounds and experiences. And it was truly, I think it blew all of our minds. Cause I just, I don't know what I was expecting, but it was so beyond my expectations of what it could be. And oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I just, Great. wow. It was awesome. Oh, that's yes. so cool. There's so much I want to ask you and I wanted to like parse out that, but there's so much I, I want to get through. And, and one thing I'm, I'm super curious about, which is like kind of a departure from what we're talking about, but maybe we'll tie into the women's retreat. So I'm curious as a public person and having your career tied up with food and health, and this is something we talk about on this podcast all the time because, you know, of my kind of background with this, but I would love yeah. to know, you know, how that, you know, your career with food and health and your, you know, being in the public eye, how has that impacted your body image or your relationship with your body over the years? Ooh, great question. 
<laughs> Love it. Um, I'm really into talking about body image because I suffered from like the poorest self-esteem body stuff ever when I was younger. Um, like I said, I was overweight. I had really terrible acne uh, and braces. I mean, it was just like triple threat, the worst. I felt so bad about myself. And I was getting, like, boys would not touch me with a 10-foot pole. Mm. Uh, and, but looking back, I realized it was because I had zero confidence in myself. I felt so lousy. And I walked around, like, with my head hung low. Literally. I've seen photos of, like, candid photos of me walking around in high school. Aww. It's just, like, it's so depressing. And I realize now, gosh, I just wasted so much energy worrying needlessly about that stuff and just the things that didn't matter, you know? Um, yeah. I think now it's tricky because obviously I'm aware of how I look. Like when I do events or I'm photographed or something, like I can't not care how I look. Um, and I think it's also tough as an ambassador for this way of living and eating and whatnot. Like I better look healthy, <laughs> but I think that's I a lot of pressure. Having, pardon? Yeah. That's a lot of pressure. It, it can be, but, I really try and not let it get to me. I mean, I just am who I am. And I think after having a baby too, my body's obviously changed. And um, I, I think one of the most important things I learned when I was studying holistic nutrition was that women are not supposed to be skinny. Uh, and when I started eating really well and actually taking care of my body from a holistic standpoint, my weight just naturally leveled out to where it has stayed for the last 10 years. And even after having the baby, I mean, I lost the weight so quickly. I bounced right back. Real testament to this lifestyle, I got to say. Yeah. And, you know, I, I went up a size in jeans. Uh, but that's about all that happened. I had to buy a new pair of pants. Um, I don't know. Now I'm just, it's not about being thin anymore, which is such a freaking relief. Um my, I just recognize that I'm like the healthiest I've ever been. And I've been able to say that for the last 10 years that I've, every day I'm the healthiest I've ever been. And I feel amazing in my body. And I'm so in awe of it that it, you know, carried this baby for nine months, which is actually 10 months. I don't know why we say nine months. It's 10. It's 40 <laughs> weeks. <laughs> so I'll just say 10 months. 10 months. Yeah. And then, you know, I breastfed for a year and a half. Like, it made food for this kid. And then, like, my body just went back to normal. And with with an extra pant size. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm just so appreciative of my physical self. And I'm finding more, the more I'm in my body, the more exercise I do, the more yoga, the more meditation, the more I eat seasonally and locally and all these things, the better I feel. And that stuff just disintegrates those feelings of inadequacy or trying to prove something or... I don't know. Like, and I'm also, I have to say, I'm really not into makeup. Like, when I see women today with this, like, weird face mask thing that's going on, this, like, matte skin and all this business, I don't know. Like, it's usually young women, actually. And I just want to shake them and say, like, what do you really look like? I bet you look so beautiful without it. Uh -huh, and yeah. I love seeing women walking around without a bunch of foundation on and whatnot. And, like, admittedly, when I'm photographed, or if I go on television or something, like, the makeup artist is just going to come and do that. And I can't stand it, but it's just the way it is. Um, but I, I, I just think we need to celebrate women's natural beauty a lot more. It needs to be in the media a lot more. And we need to be much kinder to each other and, like, say to each other how beautiful we are. You know, even when we're feeling bloated and even when – you know, whatever, our eyebrows, our brows aren't perfectly plucked or whatever. It's just, we need to give each other permission to just be naturally ourselves by do, by being naturally ourselves, you know, like, or do you know what I'm getting at? <laughs> yes, I could hear, just keep riffing. I could hear you talking about body image all day. I, I think oh. this is so helpful and what people need to hear, especially coming from someone like you who's, you know, doing this healthy holistic blog and you know still maybe struggles with it from time to time and still you know being so real about it's so helpful well it is hard being in the public eye like I sometimes think oh my gosh is that person disappointed that like I don't know whatever but I, I really just try and push those voices out of my head because 
I'm just me, and I, I want. I think I want to give women permission to have like a muffin top. You know? Yes, like, preach. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I just think it's important. I wish that I had had a role model when I was younger that was like, this is how I am. And I think there's so much body positivity coming out now. It makes me just like stand on my chair and say hip hip hooray because mm -hmm. it's like about time we're seeing diverse bodies and just diverse women in general representing women instead of these like tall, blonde, skinny models because it's just not the norm. And it just sets this really crazy precedent that is so unreachable. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I'm happy to see that things are changing and like quite quickly. It's very cool. Yeah. But all the reason for us to come together and like really support one another and make each other feel good because we're all so uniquely beautiful and we need to celebrate that more. Yes. I say that all the time. Like, thank goodness body diversity exists because if it didn't, it would be so boring. It would be so boring. Yeah. Do you know what else is interesting actually? So when I moved to Denmark, um, uh, I worked in this place called Christiania, which is this very cool self-governing uh, city within Copenhagen. You should look it up. Cool. Uh, but they have a public bathhouse there, a sauna and bathhouse. Mm -hmm. And it's it's co-ed. And I went in with some friends the first time and I was like, oh my God, I'm naked with a ton of strangers right now. And... At first, I was really freaked out and really nervous because I come from, like, a super conservative place where, you know, like, I hardly ever saw my parents naked when I was growing up. Yeah. And, you know, and, like, even in high school, like, the girls in the locker room would change, like, behind a towel or go to the toilet. It's like, I grew up with such... Yeah, same. Like, I don't know, like, not body shame, but just, like, shyness and, like, a, a, an unwillingness to just be open about it. And so the only people I saw naked or in bathing suits were models. And going to the public sauna, I'm so addicted to it, not only because I just like love being free in my body and in a very non-sexual space, which I think is also important to point out. Like we're never naked in a non-sexual place anymore. Yeah. Nudity is, is reserved for sex, which is a huge shame, which also contributes to the mystery and the misunderstanding around it because here in Denmark where like it, it's so so much more liberal I think people are much more sexually liberal but also just like generally liberal um, it's so nice not only to be in a non-sexual naked space with men but to be in a non-sexual space naked with women and actually see what women look like yeah. and my level of appreciation for the female form has just like gone through the roof I mean, there's women in there who are like 90 years old who I really think are so beautiful. And I, I don't know, I, I just I appreciate myself on such a deeper level when I see other women's bodies that are real and they're not trying to hide or cover them up or suck in their gut. It's just like we're all just shells walking around. How blessed we are to be walking around and to have these bodies to do all these awesome things with. But it's it's just meaningless. Like it's not important it's just not important yeah. enough what I mean like looking back on my high school years and even university when I was so obsessed with being thin and having clear skin all this stuff and I just wasted so many nights laying awake in bed crying about it you know yeah. and feeling like garbage because boys didn't pay attention to me and yeah. mm -hmm. whatnot I mean if I had I just wish I could tell my 15 year old self about the future because I wouldn't have believed myself if I said you know what one day it's not going to matter it's going to be, it's going to be irrelevant. Being healthy is the relevant thing, and yeah. being, being your natural healthy self. I love that you told that story, and I had a similar experience when I was in LA. Went to the Korean spot and had that exact same watershed moment of just you know seeing the body diversity and and being so inspired by it. And I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Have you ever seen that website herself? No. Oh my gosh. Google it. Everyone okay. listening, Google it. Herself is, it. it's incredible. Cool. I'll put it in the show notes. Very cool project. And uh, I kind of want to participate, but I'm like, that's probably not a good idea. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you made, should. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. My husband would be like, that's not good for business. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and that's why we have him. And that's why he's at the... That's why we have him, yeah. to make sure I'm not naked on the internet. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so this is kind of like a quick veer from nakedness to cooking. <laughs> but I have cool. to ask you while I have you um, about this. So what advice do you have about cooking. So for people like me who, you know, I love reading food blogs and, you know, like I said, I've been following yours for years and years and years and I love recipes, but I still get really stressed out and overwhelmed by it. And I think your book, your new book is kind of the answer, but um, what are some like kind of tips you can give someone about learning to cook and really, you know, I know kind of the process of, I have all the things in, in my kitchen, but I can, I think my downfall is that I kind of go into the kitchen when I'm hungry and I want to like hurry. And so what are kind of some of your, you know, to make the process of cooking lovely. And I also have this weird, sorry, this is like being selfish about me now, but I, I realized Mm -hmm. I have this weird thing where, like, if I am cooking and I'm cooking for someone else, I'm like, you can't be in the kitchen and talk to me while I do it. I have to just, like, do it and throw things together and, like, I don't even, like, want you here. I need, I, like, don't like to involve people in the process. Like, (laughs) which sounds so crazy and weird, but it's just, I think maybe it's from my years of, like, craziness about it and being a little bit too psycho about superfoods and being perfect with the way that I eat. So, like, do you have any advice for any of that? Okay, well, first of all, I'm the same way. I had people over for dinner on Friday, and uh, the guy who came over, uh, he just went vegetarian, which is really exciting, like super, uh, using air quotes, like normal guy who's like, I just want to do this for myself, my body, the environment. I'm like, that is amazing. I was so proud of him and so (laughs) excited. And um, so it was like really breathing down my neck while we were cooking. And I, (laughs) because he wanted... He was like, what are you doing now? And like, it's oh, the why words, do that? right? And I'm like, oh my God. As much as I'm really excited to share things, I get, when I am cooking, I am like, I am on another planet. I am like in a zone and I just, I can't really make conversation and I don't love people hovering. Like, <laughs> yeah. Unless I'm doing a cooking show or a demonstration, then like, of course, that's, that's the situation. But, you know, if I'm, especially because I was doing a lot of, uh, I was trying some new things out and he was very curious about it. And like, I was trying to sort of juggle. So you're not alone. Katie. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. That makes me feel better. Just like off the bat. No, yeah. <laughs> so I'm the same. Unless I'm like primed to teach cooking or have people breathing down my neck. It's a little like, Oh, I just need space to cook. Even my poor husband. Oh my God. Whenever he comes in, he's like, do you want me to trap something? I'm like, yeah, it was my boyfriend who was just like, I don't, I want to be able to talk to you and I can't talk to you if we cook something. So let's go out. <laughs> <laughs> well, smart man. <laughs> okay. So, but some tips for people who are intimidated for cooking. Yeah. I mean, I think my big one is that learn, you've got to learn how to make some staples and this will save you a lot of money in the, in the long run. So I'm talking about grains and legumes or pulses. So Learn how to cook a pot of brown rice, not with a steamer, although if a steamer is all you have, fine. I don't even know how to cook rice in a steamer, ironically. Um, Learn how to cook quinoa. Learn how to make buckwheat, whatever. Those things are very easy. They take, you know, maybe half an hour, but it's mostly totally uh, unfocused time. You just put the stuff in a pot, you boil it, reduce to simmer. You have a great video about making quinoa that's adorable and your feet are oh, dancing yeah. at part of it. That literally, <laughs> that's how I learned how to cook quinoa, like seven oh, years ago or something. That Crazy. That's so sweet. Oh, that yeah. means so much here. Oh, yeah, I was in so college sweet. and I was like 20 or something and I found that video and I was like, huh, quinoa, I could try that. <laughs> Oh my God, that is adorable. Well, yeah. see, we really wanted to make more of those videos, but we found out how time consuming. <laughs> yeah, like, I tried to like be inspired and like make some similar. Like, I have a chia pudding one that's like totally inspired by that, and it was so hard. And I was like, ah. it's hard, eh? It's yes. a, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. So much work. So much work. Anyway, um, so learning how to make the basics is really, really important. But then, uh, and also learn how to soak and cook beans from dried 
Because when people tell me they don't like beans or that they fart a lot when they eat beans, I ask them, when was the last time you made beans by yourself? And they say, never. And canned beans, first of all, they're never soaked. They pressure cook the beans, like basically pound them into submission so that they're edible, like soft. And there's all kinds of garbage in there. And which is why aquafaba, like make your own aquafaba. Don't get the stuff from the can. You shouldn't drink bean juice. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem I have with aquafaba. Um, Wait, with anyway, what? what? I don't aquafaba. even know what you're Sorry, what is sorry. That? So there's this thing going around. It's all over the internet, actually, if you Google mm -hmm. it. Aquafaba is the liquid from a can of chickpeas that you can make into vegan meringue. Huh, never heard of that. It's fascinating. It's this French chef that discovered it, and it's like, yeah, it's, it's all over. It's all over now. But mm -hmm. I'm not really into bean juice from a can you can make it yourself but yeah anyway um so and the reason people don't like beans they say is because canned beans have the worst texture of all time it's like eating complete wallpaper paste so cook beans yourself from scratch it'll change your life make a huge batch make a huge batch of brown rice make a huge batch of lentils and you just have those in your fridge and what these are called are rollovers and rollovers are intentional leftovers. Mm. And this is all in my second cookbook. I have a whole thing about rollovers. Love so what it. rollovers allow you to do is you have your staples, and then throughout the week, you either run out of a staple and then you make another one, or you're just adding stuff. You're just adding, you know, I'm going to add spinach, and then I'm going to toast some sunflower seeds. I'm going to add some roast pumpkin and I'm going to put pomegranate seeds on top. So it's, you have your foundation and then what you're doing is you're adding to that. So you might be spending 15, 20 minutes in the kitchen every day, but you'll be eating well every single one of those days with that in time investment. And it's really nothing in the long run. Plus you have leftovers for lunch if you want to take your lunch to work or to school. Um, I mean, it's that's how I cook every day. That's how I can eat healthy every day. I don't spend an hour in the kitchen every day necessarily. I mean, I would, I love to do that. But I mean, if I'm pressed for time, it's all about planning and it's all about being prepared. Like I'm thoroughly convinced everyone can eat healthy as long as they put a little prep into it. It's just, otherwise you're going to get takeout. It's yeah. Murphy's law. Yeah. Is that Murphy's law? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. What it works is? here. I have no idea, but let's just say it's that. <laughs> let's say it's inevitable. Yes, that's so, what we mean. <laughs> that's what we mean. <laughs> oh my gosh, I could talk to you forever, but I have so many more things that I want to ask you, so okay, let's yeah. try to do these as quickfire questions. Okay. Okay. So one thing that I really want to talk to you about, again, and I wish that we had like another full hour because I think we could talk about this for another full hour, but I am a huge Abraham Hicks, Esther Hicks fan <gasps> follower, and I heard you mention that, and I was like, of course she is, because I've loved her forever, so of oh, course we yeah. both like that. So how did you get into Esther Hicks, and can you talk a little bit about manifesting and, you know, what kind of things that maybe a couple takeaways that are really beneficial to you and, you know, that you're kind of working with presently. Oh, my gosh. Fun. Okay. Well, I don't know if you heard me say action journey earlier, but um, that's an Esther Hicks one for totally. sure. Or April. Yeah. Um, okay. I got into Esther Hicks because um, I don't know if you know this brand called Living Libations. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I just, like, put their stuff on my skin before we talked. I'm obsessed no with way. them. They're <laughs> okay. Canadian, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Nadine yeah. is a friend of mine. Oh my gosh, yeah. starstruck. Oh! <laughs> she is like, ah, she's incredible. She's my, like, that's the only products I use. Tell her I love all of her products and I use all of them and okay. they're amazing. <laughs> yeah, they're incredible. And I'll just like re reaffirm that she literally has people all over planet Earth just making oils for her. They're all like the most ethically produced or like beyond organic standards. Like it's just the best quality of all time. You'll never get anything better. Never period. The yeah. end. Like, I, and I'm just her cheerleader till the end. I think she's the most incredible woman. Anyway, me too. <clears throat> I love her stuff. Oh, I'm so glad you know it. Cause I'm always telling people about it. It's just, yes. Oh, so anyway, good. I love it so much. Okay. So I was at Nadine's house and she had this like voice in the background, just like talking and talking. And I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said, it's Mr. Hicks. 
this was in 2006, I think. And, um, wow, that's a long time ago. Anyway, um, I said, it sounds really interesting. And she said, do you want me to give, I can loan you one of the CDs. And on the drive home back to Toronto, because she's um, north of the city, about three hours, I had three hours to listen to Esther Hicks. And I was just like, it was like a brick wall of truth, like running into a brick wall of truth. And I was like, I don't care how this woman is channeling Abraham. I don't care what the story is. These words are pure gold. And it was at a time when things were not going very well for me in my life. I felt really lost. I felt really confused about my path. I felt like just I didn't know what was going on. And hearing these words, I mean, Esther, Esther it's all about, you know, attracting the law of attraction and uh, how you can manifest uh, things in your life. It all made so much sense to me, although not easy to implement, um, a good challenge and a good thing to sort of entertain all of these ideas. And it has changed my life so dramatically and so obviously, her teachings. Um, I just can't say enough good about them. So a couple of the lessons that are really powerful for me and that I use on a daily basis, one is making a decision and lining up with it. Um, for instance, when I moved to Denmark, I was so devastated to leave my family and friends behind that I was still emotionally in Canada for months and I would just cry and I was upset. I had no friends here, I had no job. I literally had nothing and I was emotionally living in Canada and physically living in Denmark. Again, listen to Esther Hicks and was, I realized that I had made a decision to move to Denmark but I hadn't lined up with it. And the second I did that, Katie, the second you, I said... How did you do that? Well, first I... So I, I, I like to write, obviously. <laughs> so I wrote down repeatedly, like, I am living in Denmark. I just wrote it down over and over again like, and until it was in my head and I wasn't living in Canada anymore. I was like, I'm living in Denmark and I need to be in Denmark. So a couple of days after this, I decided that... So one of the reasons I didn't have a job was because I found out that holistic nutrition in Denmark does not exist. It's not a profession. So I just finished my education, dropped everything in my life to move in with this guy, uh, and I couldn't get a job here. It was actually a very devastating time of life. But because I was emotionally living in Canada, it just made everything worse. So I decided that I had to line up with my decision to move here. So I thought, okay, what is the one thing I can do in Denmark that's, you know, I can actually do legally? Um, how can I do this? So I took my resume around to restaurants to vegetarian restaurants and one of them hired me and within a week I had a job within two weeks I had like business acquaintances you know acquaintances or job acquaintances within three weeks I had like a coffee date with one of them in four weeks I had a friend mm. and then slowly things started coming together and well I mean it was it was all just because I made the decision to line up with being in Denmark and then I was in Denmark it was really cool no, um, the other one is, oh, I just had it. What was I going to say? Well, she she talks about this emotional scale, which I think is really important, and always moving up the emotional scale as much as you can. And um, I guess what that means is she's she always emphasizes reaching for the best feeling thought that you can find in a situation, because if we're trying to raise our vibration, if we are beating the drum of not having something. Um, that's what the universe is going to give us. If we don't have any money and we're just constantly in this vortex of like, I don't have any money, I don't have any money. I mean, of, of course you're not going to have any money. But if you can reach for a thought that I would like to have more money, that is actually moving up the emotional scale and raising your vibration to a point where you will attract money as opposed to saying to the universe, you don't have any because that's what it's going to give you. I use money as an example. Um, it could be anything. It could be a partner. It could be a new friend. It could be a cookbook deal, it could be whatever, but it's instead of being very absorbed in the negative and the things that you don't have, reaching for the best feeling thought raises your vibration. And to a, if you can get to the point where you are constantly living in abundance, which is where I'd like to think I am, um, the manifestation happens so quickly. I actually have to be careful about what I ask for now because I am... I'm in a place, uh, vibrationally speaking, I can't, say, can't believe I'm using that word, but it's true, 
that um, it's an ask and receive constantly. It's it's unbelievable. Like. I don't want to give too many examples, but I mean, I want to work with this person. I get an email the next day. Cool. I really want this kind of thing to happen. I get, you know, a phone call about that very thing that afternoon. It's just insane. And I really credit my success to these philosophies. And it sounds really obtuse when you're out of it and you don't really understand how to make it work. But for anyone who's interested, look up Esther Hicks. Yeah. Um, she has tons of stuff on YouTube. And... If you just really listen to these teachings, to the words, they make so much sense. And I think what's great about her is she's, um, they're very easy lessons to listen to, but it just takes, it takes some time to integrate. It's, they're really big ideas. They're just presented in a really simple way, which I like. Yeah. And, um, no, I, I can't say enough about the law of attraction and what it's done for me. Uh, it's done everything for me. It's changed yeah. my entire life. Me too. Yes. I, I completely, completely agree. And it was, Ooh. yeah, it was just, it's something we can totally geek out about. And I, you know, I talk about it all the time on here. And it, I always say like, you know, I, I'm constantly listening to her YouTube rants and I'm just like, yes. I'll, I'll just like Google or like I'll YouTube, you know, anything happening. Abraham Hicks relationship issue, Abraham Hicks, you know, mm -hmm. body image, Abraham Hicks pimple, like whatever. Like there's always yep. a, a fix with Abraham. But I'm curious for you, you know, you talk about being in the flow and manifesting things very quickly and kind of the speeding up of things that can happen in your life when you're in the, you know, what they call vortex. You're in the vortex. Right. Yes. <laughs> but I would love to know, you know, from, from your perspective of like, when you inevitably do kind of fall out of the the vortex, how do you get back in? You know, what are some of the, the things you do to get back in or, or to even to stay in? Yes, um, that's a really good question. And I think this is, you know, this is where the challenging part comes in because when you are out of the vortex, the longer it lasts, the harder it is to get back in, the, the harder it is to get that perspective again and to feel good. Um, but I think for me, it's uh, one of the things is actually coming back into my body. And this is something I actually, um, I'm learning more and more. I think in the last year, post having my son and uh, having time finally to exercise again, what exercise does for me is it brings me into my body. And when I'm in my body, I'm present. And presence, I actually think, is much more important uh, for the manifestations to occur because um, more so than positivity because generally if we're present, if generally we're, we're in the moment, we are pretty happy and content um, because if something's upsetting us, it's very rarely happening in that moment. It's either has happened or it's going to happen. But if we can bring ourselves into the present moment, we realize actually that things are okay in this moment. And, um, you know, worrying about things that are about to happen or dwelling on things that are in the past, those are just stories. They actually don't exist. So being present allows us to just be here and now and not have stories in our head. And that's what I'm always trying to do when I'm out of the vortex is because I'm usually out of the vortex because I'm worried about something. Not that's happening, that has happened or will happen. And when I come back to now, it seems to give me a lot of clarity. And a way that I do that is by being in my body. So doing yoga, um, breath work is huge. Um, even just hula hooping or something. Just getting into my physical self. I think, you know, who's really into this is Anthony Robbins. Yes, changing your Tony state. Tony Robbins. Yeah, changing your state. Yes. Yeah. Hugely important. And the first time... First time I heard him talk about this, I was like, that's a bit fluffy. But my gosh, I've really learned it. I think because oh, before I used to yeah. exercise very much to like get muscles and be skinny in high school and university. Now I exercise to be in my body and to just appreciate the ultimate deliciousness that is moving in like the movement to yeah. feel in myself. God, it's just the best. I love it. Even and that can going be, on a walk. It doesn't have to be anything strenuous. Yeah. Yes, it is open walking or just biking and just being, just feeling my body move and feeling how lucky I am to be able to do that is like just awesome. Even if it's going up my friggin' staircase, honestly, it can yeah. just be that just to feel alive. Yeah. Because when you're moving, 
you're alive and you're present and you're connected to something. So pulling it back to the question, it's, it's about centering myself in some way and just remembering that whatever I'm worried about or whatever I'm dwelling on is not happening. Yeah. And then that raises my vibration. Mm. And being in gratitude is a big one. So yeah. instead of like, yeah, dwelling on or worrying about just being thankful that I'm here in this moment and everything is, is okay, trusting. Yeah. Yes. Oh, such, yeah. such, such, such good advice. And I love that. My therapist has this thing that she has me do when I'm like really in my head. Because when you're in the past or in the future, that's when you're out of the flow. And she says, sound, breath, and movement. Like, get up. Like, sometimes I just do jumping jacks or I shake my arms around wildly. And it mm -hmm. you look crazy, but it helps. <laughs> yeah. It really helps. Have you ever done this? like shaking thing do you ever just shake oh yeah totally i shake my arms around every single morning and i like yell affirmations it's like part of my routine it's so weird <laughs> <laughs> it's so that is weird. really cool yeah um okay no, it's weird at all Every people like it doesn't matter how weird it is just like use the tools and i think yes. It used to drive me nuts when people would tell me just, like, get in my body and stuff. It used to annoy the heck out of me. I don't know why. But now I see, like, they're so right. Tony Robbins is totally right. I know. There's something yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So these quick fire yeah. questions I think will actually be a little bit a little bit quicker. Um, but, you know, take your time. But, okay. So favorite fruit and favorite vegetable. <laughs> um, favorite fruit. <sighs> Uh, I want to say like a, I mean, I love figs. I actually had an out of season fig this morning for breakfast and it was the biggest treat ever. Yum. Uh, let's get, let's say figs. Figs are so, so good. like, they're so fleeting. Yeah. So fleeting. They're only around for a few weeks. Yeah. They're so good. Um, favorite vegetable, sweet potato. Nice. Probably a sweet potato. They're so I love good. them. Yes. Best thing you've eaten in the last week or month. Oh, okay. Funnily enough, sweet potato. Um, so on Friday night when I had this guy breathing down my neck, this new, new vegetarian, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I made I made a chili, uh, just like a, you know, like a, a chili with beans and whatever. Anyway, I was cutting up sweet potato to to uh to put in the chili and then it, they spoke to me, which often happens when I'm cooking. Love um it. so they said, "No, roast us in the oven and then char us in a pan so here's what i did i roasted i cut sweet potatoes in half so they had a nice flat side i roasted them flat side up in the oven for like 15 20 minutes until they were you know nice and tender and then i coated the bottom of a pan with coconut oil melted that and then seared the potatoes in the coconut oil um until they were like not black, but like very caramelized on the bottom and then toss them with cumin seeds and maple syrup. Oh my God. Oh, and then I stuck that on top of the chili in this like tower. It was like the best thing I needed so long. I loved it. Sorry. I know that's my food. Can I, mm. am I allowed to say my own? Food? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I okay. wish that I was at that party and I would have not breathed on your neck. I would have left you alone. Although I would have like wanted to watch you cause I'm sure that would have been great. But oh my God, that sounds delicious. But I can always tell you afterwards what I did. Totally. It was so good. And they were so grateful. These people, they were like, this is the best thing I've had in years. I'm like, which is not true, but uh, they were very generous and very excited and, I'm so glad I listened to those sweet potatoes because they were great. They knew what they wanted. Totally. Yep. Oh, my gosh. I love that so much. I was going to ask mm. this question, which you kind of already went to recently, but what is? do you have a favorite recipe you've ever created? Well, I do love the life-changing loaf of bread very, very much. Yes. Um, that was, the, that was the, actually the recipe that launched my new roots into the blogging stratosphere that was crazy um wow I there's over that. fifteen thousand, fifteen hundred comments on that post yeah it's wow. just outrageous um and that was in 2014 um i really love that recipe i make it all the time and for people that are breadaholics like myself uh i highly encourage you to try it because it's it's just it's the easiest bread ever and everything's activated soaked overnight and it's just really simple and so delicious and a great bread alternative. If I you're looking for that. I remember when that when yeah. that post came out and I always wanted to make it but I, it's like one of the few that I haven't tried yet. So I should I should do that. 
oh my goodness, you got to do it. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, I think people's complaint is that like it's an ingredient. Like there's a lot of ingredients for it. You got to get the psyllium and the chia and the flax. And blah, blah, blah. I but have, I mean, but I have it all, so I have no excuse. Yeah. Okay, then you got to make it because you don't even get a bowl dirty. Oh my! You literally goodness. mix everything in the baking dish. It's so simple. It's so simple. Yeah, you, I've got to do You should make it. it this evening. Yes, yes. I think I, I, think I might. <laughs> like soak it, soak it tonight. Bake it tomorrow morning. Yes, Ooh. it's so easy and really so so gratifying too. Mm, yeah, I could totally do that. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. I'm gonna do it. Okay, um, so I wrote this book about journaling that came out about a year ago, and so I'm wondering, are you ever a writer? Do you oh, – well, obviously you're a writer, but um, are you a journaler? Do you write, you know, to kind of process your feelings and, and get to know yourself better? I used to, but since having a baby, <laughs> that's yeah. gone out the window. I actually write poetry more often than journaling. Oh, and, no way. Um, yeah, my poems are – I mean, they're not really, they're like a slice into my life. And it's funny because looking back at my journal through the years and all these poems I've written, um, I don't know. It's like I, I, I know where I was coming from at the time. And I can read, I mean, there could be 100 pages written about, you know, in the subtext of the poem. So actually it's, I don't want to say it's more efficient, but I, I, I would rather write less and have it, mean more no I don't want to I don't know I'd rather write less and have it like be this like crystalline moment or something yeah. or the crystalline thought yeah but I I mean if I had the time well, let me tell you I'd be journaling <laughs> a lot more it's just because of a priority yeah 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 oh I love that <laughs> now my priority is Instagram <laughs> 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 not really not really <laughs> but yeah so this is a question I love asking everyone who, who comes on the podcast because I think it gives us a glimpse into their lives. But what are your morning routines, maybe the first three things you do when you wake up in the morning and how that affects how the rest of your day goes? Okay. Well, I, um, I'm usually awoken to my son calling me into his room. Um, so the first thing I do is, I mean, yeah, there's a laundry list of things I actually have to do before I get to me, but that's okay. So we'll start with like, my son is at school and I come home. How about that? Got it. Got it. Because <laughs> that's when my time actually starts. Um, yeah, I wish I could say like, oh, I set an alarm for an hour before he wakes up so I can like honor myself. No, this doesn't happen. I like every second of sleep I can have, I will take. So uh, yes, so I don't worry about me until he's at school. And I, um, I've just started, well, not just, but about four months ago, I started doing intermittent fasting. Do you know about this? Can yeah. This? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I started doing that, which is great because taking him to school and back, like the whole morning routine is almost like two hours. So by the time I get home, it's like a oh, breakfast time. But before I do that, um, I, when I first get up in the morning while he's eating breakfast, I drink a lot of water. Um, I start with warm water with lemon, and then I usually have, I don't know, another couple, gla- couple glasses before I take him to school. And then... Um, yeah, lemon water, more water. I try and exercise right when I get home too because if I eat, I find that I just feel full and I don't, you know, then I have to digest. So yeah, I try I and too. exercise as soon as I'm back um, before I eat the first meal. Do you mostly do yoga? Um, what are some things that you like for exercise? Yeah, I do um, – I do the sun salutations in the morning and then I move into a body weight training routine that I have. Um, I got into body weight training about a year or so ago oh, cool. when I started Is getting that like seriously back. In planks and that sort of thing? All kinds of stuff. It's pretty much just, it's great because I don't like the gym anymore. Used to love it, can't deal with it anymore. But it's just using your body weight as resistance and it just, God, it makes you feel so powerful and strong. It's really awesome. So yeah, it's like, planks but it's a it's it's interesting it's actually a a combination of yoga and um it's almost like you take a yoga position and you think how can I make this dynamic so um let's say you're in um like a dog split so you're in downward dog with one of your legs up Mm -hmm. a body weight training would be to bring your knee into your nose and then push it back out again so cool do that 20 30 times and then hold at the top for 30 seconds 
then you tell me how your butt feels. So wow, cool. it is like yoga, except you take the movement, you make it dynamic, and then, you know, that, I mean, that move itself just works your whole body. It's incredible. Yeah. One Did of my you favorites. learn this yourself? Yeah. Did you, is, do you do a video of this? Like, is this something There's actually on tons blog? of videos on YouTube. I started, I started watching YouTube videos some time ago, um, and then sort of just developed my own routine. But one of the things, um, on the weekend, I found a really good one. There's a YouTube channel called Boho Beautiful. Oh, cool. <laughs> and uh, she's actually Canadian. Her name is Juliana. And uh, she has great routines. And she just added a winter one. She does uh, basically like a very um, cardiovascular style yoga in ten, minus 10 degrees Celsius, which is like insanely cold in leggings and a sweater. So um, Wait, she, does, the she tapes them that. outside? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Whew. Like a mad woman. She's really hardcore and but not in a actually she's not really hardcore. She's great and all of her I really love all of her programs. But this was the one she just added and I really like it. Like it's it's good. Oh good. I'm, I'm sore I'm after. Try it like this great. week. I'm gonna, Boho, do, beautiful. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. I'm gonna be baking bread. So many things. <laughs> so many things. <laughs> <laughs> what about in the evening? What are the last three th- three things you do before bed and how do you relax and wind down? I try and get away from a screen for at least an hour before bed, but that's often in vain because I don't know if there's something I got to look up or I don't know. It, ah. Yeah, having an online life is pretty challenging sometimes to tear yourself away. But um, I try and give myself at least an hour before bed. Um, also because I can have problems falling asleep. I have a very busy brain. And uh, I find that if I'm on a screen, then my body's just not producing melatonin. <laughs> because I'm literally tricking my body into thinking it's daytime. So I try and give myself that 60 minutes for the proper signals and hormones to be released. So that's, uh, if anyone's having trouble sleeping out there, that's a good tip. Um, I like to shower before bed, actually. It just I do that relaxes too. my muscles. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. And I like to get into bed clean. Me too. Yeah, I'm not a morning showerer at all. I'm a Same. before bed showerer. I love yeah, that. okay, funny. Most people aren't, but I just love getting clean and fresh and warm and then crawling into bed. It's so mm-hmm. relaxing. Yeah. Um, then I like to read. I usually read a cookbook. Um, I have cookbooks stacked up on my bedside table. Mm-hmm. And then what else? I do a sort of just a little visualization before I fall asleep and imagine all the things that I want unfolding in great detail because I've learned it again from Esther Hicks that the – more detailed you can be in your manifestations, the faster they will arrive. And it's very true. So, oh, so cool. Yeah. So cool. so cool. I need to start doing yes. that before bed visualizing. I kind of do it right before I fall asleep, but, um, yeah, be more detailed. I, I thank you for that reminder. Okay. Oh, so, yes. I mean, like I even, I even manifested my husband, let me just say <laughs> really? down to his hair. Like, wow. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I really did. It was the craziest thing when I met because I wanted to be like, um, do you know something? Like, I have invented you and you are here. <laughs> That's magical. But I, did. I love that it was so crazy. much. That's so inspiring. But, like, it was really nuts. Like, down to the nth degree, Whoa. I called him in. It was really, yeah. That's really neat. super cool. And yes. you met him in such a magical way. Yeah, it's. I'm moving to New York and finding an apartment in New York is, is a challenge, but, um, as you know, Esther would say like totally doable, but I just, I think I need to do that process of how you manifested your husband and just like think about this apartment and what it's going to be like and get into detail with it so I can call it in. (laughs) Definitely. And like Katie, imagine yourself in the space and like, look around and like what is it what does the furniture look like how does it smell who are your neighbors like really seriously go into detail with it and it will happen that's the amazing thing but you I think the hardest part about manifesting the things you desire is believing you deserve it first of all not getting in your own way because a lot of us even if it's not a deserving thing it's like oh this isn't really going to work like there's this voice in the back of our head that this is impossible Mm -hmm. and even even if you're writing down all the things that you want and you really think you're on track, if you if there's a a cell in your body that doesn't believe this is possible, it's not going to work. So 
Yeah, how do you <laughs> how do you really quiet that? <sighs> Again, it's like I think that's why visualization is so important because when you visualize yourself in that apartment that you're looking for or you visualize yourself with your partner, you raise your vibration because you change your feelings. So if you imagine yourself in this apartment, you automatically imagine how you feel in it. You're like, oh, this is so cozy or I love this next door neighbor I have or I love the view. And automatically just by thinking those things, you change your vibration which attracts that what you're thinking about yeah so Ooh. that's why the more detail you can get with the visualizations the easier and faster it's going to come to you so helpful thank you so much oh my goodness <laughs> this this has all been so amazing and i'm i'm so grateful for all the time that you spent with me when your book is coming out tomorrow so congratulations again yeah. thank you i'm so so excited this was thank you so much so much it? fun oh good i had a great time too i can't believe how long we've been talking i know i know i know and i have honestly oh. like i didn't ask you a lot of questions so you'll have to come back when you have more time because there's a lot of questions people Deal. listening know that i just like that i ask everyone that i didn't even get a chance to ask you so you'll have to come back for sure but okay. i have to ask you the final I question on. oh okay yes the, the final question just is, the name of this podcast is Let It Out. So what does that mean to you? And is there anything else that you want to let out or recommend or anything that you feel like you didn't share that you wanted to, that you wish I would have asked on the podcast? I just really want to make sure I've wrung you dry. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, wow. Oh, okay, yeah. Let It Out. Um, I'm gonna like. I feel like an after-school special whenever I have the opportunity to talk about anything like this. But um, I don't know. I guess <laughs> I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. It's like again, it's too big a question. I need I need boundaries. Yeah. Um. Gosh. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really stuck, and I really no. keep coming up with like the most. She answers in my head. No, that's okay. And really just, you know, if there's anything else you wanted to share, anything that, you know, you wish I would have asked you or anything you want to recommend from, you know, like a book or a movie or a podcast, whatever it is that you, like, didn't get to let out, here's your time. <laughs> I feel so complete. <laughs> Good. Perfect. <laughs> then my job is done. If there's not, if there's not a big okay, answer to that question, bye. then I did a good job. <laughs> You did a great job. I really feel complete. Those are great questions, too. Thank you. Good. Oh, my goodness. Well, again, yeah. thank you so much for coming on the podcast and spending so much time with me, but also all of the content that you've given me and inspiration that you've given me on My New Roots over the past, you know, seven or eight years that I've been following you and been friends with you in an internet sort of a way. So I'm so glad to know you in real life now. Oh, oh. oh that means so much to me. And uh, I think what you're doing is just amazing, too. And keep it up and... Yeah. Hooray. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Sarah's amazing. I hope you guys loved that as much as I did. Quick shout out to our sponsors. Remember to check out Care of Supplements. We love them. We know them. They give you personalized care, which is great. We don't get that ever in life. So, you know, well, hopefully you do sometimes. But anyway, you can for sure get it with Care of and 50% off your first order when you go to TakeCareOf.com and use the code Katie at checkout. That's TakeCareOf.com and use the code Katie, K-A-T-I-E, for 50% off. Okay, also try Aptive. We love Aptive. They're fantastic. You can exercise anywhere in the world. And they're constantly adding new classes. And there's great music. We love them. And you can get a free trial for 30 days. Might as well just try it out, you know? That's Aptive.com, A-A-P-T-I-V.com. And then, you know, just that's the website. And then use the code Let It Out at checkout for a free 30-day trial. All right. All of this is in the show notes. Check out the show notes and tweet at me. Tweet at Sarah. Let us know what you think of this week's episode. And the emoji is the carrot. I love carrots. You probably also love carrots. So tweet at us a carrot to let us know that you're still listening to me rambling at this point. And I love you guys. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you again for listening. Share this with a friend. Maybe blast it out of your speakers. You know, when you're driving, other people could hear. 
or you know when you're walking uh, you can just have it playing on your phone at a coffee shop it's always annoying when people are doing that but if it's this podcast who knows maybe everyone will crowd around and want to listen all right i hope to see your carrots really soon and i'll talk to you guys next week